Cool, great. Yeah, thank you, Pejman and Martin, for organising this. Uh, it's really great to be back and to give this in person. It's been a long time since I've done something like this, as we all know from last year. Um, so, actually, the last time I was back here at Charlie's was in 2014. As Martin mentioned, I was here for a, a short summer research stint. Um, and, yeah, so it, it's great to be back. And uh, today I'll be giving this talk about the work that I did during my PhD over in the UK. Um, so final stages now, I did it with the University of Liverpool and the Cockroft Institute of Accelerator Science and Technology. Um, in October of last year, uh, I started a postdoc at the, <laughs> at, um, at the University of Melbourne in the Medical Accelerator Physics Group. Um, so I recently relocated back to Australia uh, after almost four years um, in the UK. Um, but yeah, so today, just a quick overview about what I'll be talking about. Um, so firstly, briefly go over my background and then an introduction into proton therapy, particle therapy, beam diagnostics, uh, my PhD project, um, and then the Clatterbridge Cancer Center, which is where most of this work uh, was optimized for, and then um, some studies uh, with different simulation codes. Um, as well as a study of the beam dynamics of the facility and then some measurements that we did uh, with several different detectors. Uh, so briefly, just to start off, I grew up mostly in Perth, um, so I actually got my bachelor's degree at UWA. Um, and then after that, I moved to Wollongong to do my master's um, and then to the UK to do a PhD. Um, so I was part of this European project called the Optimization of Medical Accelerators. Um, which was a great opportunity, which allowed me to continue on um, in the field of particle therapy and hoping to wrap up everything with my PhD really soon. Um, final stage is still waiting very patiently. Um, yeah. Otherwise, at the moment, I'm with uh, the University of Melbourne. This is what our group looks like. We're a very new group. We only started in March of 2019. Uh, so my group leader is Dr. Susie Sheehy. Our group is a, an accelerators-focused group, so uh, we deal mostly with um, medical and indus industrial as well as uh, research applications of accelerators, but our main area is uh, particle therapy. So um, as I'm sure all of you are really familiar, um, with this here, we have a LINAC. Um, so, of course, there's lots of different delivery techniques in order to deliver a conformal um, dose distribution to treat patients. In proton therapy, we have something similar here. Um, so, over the next few slides, I'll sort of recap proton therapy, which I'm sure a lot of you guys would also be quite familiar with, um, as I was going over with Pejman earlier, um, the stuff that you do in your course. Um, anyway, so in proton therapy, we have something similar. Um, a lot of the developments in terms of the delivery and the technology in proton therapy is pretty much modeled off conventional. So here we have uh, the patient couch, which is in the center, um, and then a gantry which rotates around the patient. Um, so these gantries are typically the most significant uh, contributors to cost and weight in a proton therapy facility. They can be hundreds of tons. Um, so in modern systems, you have a gantry that rotates completely around the patient. Otherwise, um, in other facilities, you might have a fixed beam port horizontally or vertically. And of course, with protons, we have um, the depth dose profile with the Bragg peak, um, and this offers several advantages in terms of the dose profile. So for example, if we have 16 MV x-rays, so you see the dose distribution um, there's quite a large amount of dose that's deposited, especially in the entrance region. Whereas with protons, due to the interactions with matter, protons lose energy, mostly through Coulomb interactions, uh, which gives us this nice Bragg peak. And dependent on the energy of the protons, so the initial energy, uh, they lose a maximum amount of the energy at the Bragg peak, which you can position specifically at the side of the tumor. Um, of course, though, with tumors, we know they aren't always, say, a centimeter in size. They vary, and they vary in depth in terms of the human body. So in order to generate a, a dose distribution that has sufficient coverage over the tumor, um, you superimpose 
lots of these Bragg peaks to generate a spread out Bragg peak. Um, and in terms of the physical dose, this means that you can deliver a, a conformal amount of radiation to your target sites. With protons as well, um, so because they slow down and they stop and they deposit the majority of the energy at the Bragg peak, there's limited dose, minimum dose that's deposited uh, just after the distal fall off. The heavier you go in terms of the ions, there is more nuclear fragmentation, so that changes the shape of the Bragg peak. Um, but it's a Bragg peak which allows for higher possibility of tumor control. So uh, you can treat all kinds of uh, candidates in terms of uh, tumors with particle therapy. Um, there's always the sort of the debate about cost effectiveness of proton therapy because it is very expensive compared with conventional. Um, we have lots of advanced techniques in that you can deliver a conformal dose already. So it becomes a question of um, can we capitalize on the differences in terms of the, um, the dosimetric characteristics to provide a better outcome um, versus, so with protons versus photons. Um, so often the strongest case is for pediatric cancers. Uh, so typically a lot of the newer facilities as well treat mostly pediatric patients. Um, in terms of the energy, uh, with proton therapy, clinical energies range from between 60 to about 250 MeV or up to 330 MeV if you go into imaging. Uh, so, of course, comparing the treatment planning um, and the dose distributions with photons versus protons, um, pretty much for most tumors and I assume with most cases, uh, when comparing the two, you can always generally get a better dose distribution if you use protons. Um, so for the comparative intensity modulated proton therapy, you can see comparing the two plans, um, there's a lot less excess dose that's delivered to surrounding healthy tissue um, using protons and with the DVHs here. So um, these are squares and that corresponds to conventional and these are triangles here which correspond to proton therapy. You can see that less dose as well is uh, deposited to your healthy tissue in the lungs. Um, so the rationales for using um, protons or heavier ions relates to two sort of quantities, uh, the first being the linear energy transfer or the LET. And so the LET is defined as the energy loss over a finite path length. So um, with LET, so typically the heavier you go um, with protons onwards, you have um, higher LETs which are possible. And this corresponds pretty well with biological outcome. So the higher the LET, the higher the possibility of biological damage, which means that you can induce more single and double strand breaks. Um, but not just the frequency of these breaks, but also the complexity. So we're talking about clustered damage, um, as well as the spatial distribution of these breaks, which means that the DNA is harder to repair. Um, and then in terms of the biological outcomes as well, we have the relative biological effectiveness, or RBE value. Um, and it's basically a comparative factor between two different modalities uh, comparing the same biological outcomes um, based on different doses and modalities. The reference modality being conventional. So for example, with protons, um, a fixed value of 1.1 is used. Um, this is a bit controversial because it isn't 1.1, but this means that uh, photons versus protons, protons can do 10% more biological damage. Uh, the heavier the ions as well as with carbon, um, you go into uh, sort of two to three times this factor. Um, so you can see in this plot here the different particle species. Uh, there is a much higher LET that's possible, especially at the Bragg Peak region. Um, so there is a lot that's been worked on recently to look into beams with um, using different particle species. This is a bit more difficult in terms of the accelerator in order to produce this and transport this down. Um, but by also mixing beams with different particle sources, you can utilize the advantages from the different particles as well. Um, so across the world, there's more than 100 operating facilities which offer proton and carbon ion therapy. Um, only 12 offer carbon, all the rest are proton. 
And so there's a huge prevalence of these facilities in Europe, the US, um, as well as Japan, and a few in China. Uh, of course, in Australia, we have the Australian Bragg Center in Adelaide, which is currently being built. Um, last I read, treatment was anticipated to begin in four years. Um, so this facility will have a synchrotron, um, which will be able to produce protons up to 330 MeV uh, for imaging. So over the past um, recent years, like five or so years, there's been a huge growth in the number of proton therapy facilities. There's 40 under construction, 30 more which are planned around the world. Over 220,000 patients have been treated. Um, so a lot of uh, different vendors have now um, implemented all of the recent technological advances in terms of um, accelerators and diagnostics. Um, and this has really translated into a huge boost in the number of facilities and the accessibility of proton therapy. However, there are a lot of challenges. Um, these relate to the biology, physics, um, and technology. Um, and essentially, if we want to have more particle therapy facilities worldwide, um, we need to reduce the costs, um, make these facilities more accessible to different countries around the world, and improve on um, the beam delivery. So basically, we need machines that are smaller, cheaper, and faster to run and operate. Um, in terms of the challenges, though, if we look and focus on the technology, so especially with the accelerators um, and how we transport and deliver the beam as well as measure the beam, there's a lot of room and opportunities for improvement. So uh, this sort of leads into my PhD project, which was based on beam diagnostics. And beam diagnostics, we can sort of define as basically anything, any system or instrumentation or tool that you have that measures different properties about the beam. Um, so this may include the beam current, position, or profile. So here we have a schematic of the Paul Scherer Institute in Switzerland, which is a proton therapy facility. Um, and basically, with beam diagnostics, you can see all throughout the beam lines there's lots and lots of tools, and basically you want these diagnostics to be able to tell you that the beam being produced by your cyclotron or synchrotron or whatever your accelerator is, is being transported through the beam lines, and the beam that ends up at the patient is as being prescribed by your treatment plan. Um, so depending on what sort of delivery system you have, uh, so here we have a pencil beam scanning nozzle. So this is right at the end of the treatment line and the beam exits out through here and it reaches the patient. So you might have multiple monitors which give you lots of different measurements of the beam. Of course you have your two dose monitors like in conventional radiation therapy. The same gold standard ion chambers are used in proton therapy. Um, and so these are important tools which give you primarily the dose that's being delivered in real time, um, as well as measurements of uh, the intensity profile and position. So these are also measured by ion chambers. Um, ideally, you would want a single device which can give you these measurements um, quickly, online, so actively, uh, that is reliable, stable, has minimal saturation, even at high dose rates, uh, is radiation hard, and interferes pretty minimally with the beam. Um, and that will provide you these measurements with high spatial and time resolution. So, of course, we don't really have a single device that does this. Um, we need multiple devices. Um, but a lot of the technology that we see in, in the clinic and in medical physics, um, sort of back to basics, has originated from high-energy physics. So here we have the world's largest accelerator, which is the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, it's 27 kilometers long in circumference, and it lies underneath the countries of Switzerland and France. So there's lots of different experiments that are run at the LHC, including the LHCB, or beauty experiment. And so this is a massive detector system that was used there to measure and reconstruct the interactions of different events. Um, and there were lots of these sensors um, that are actually in this detector. And these are silicon sensors, which consist of two back-to-back -back on each half. And you can see there's a gap in between the two, which allows the beam to pass through with minimal interference. 
So these are called vertex locator or VELO detectors. And the University of Liverpool Physics Department was actually involved in the design and the development of these detectors. So the idea was conceived uh, many years ago, hey, what if we can use the same technology and bring it from a high energy, high vacuum environment, but instead optimize it for a clinical setting. So can we develop these detectors into an online, online dose monitor, a system that we can use in the clinic for dose monitoring? So how would this work if you imagine a proton beam and it passes through the different components in the delivery system and it generates a scattering of protons which surround the core of the beam? And if we can measure this with the detector, so just the outside region, which we term as the halo, um, and if we can correlate this to the total dose distribution, then we can get some idea of the dose that's being delivered in real time. So the idea was to develop this into a standalone system that we could implement and optimize for the Clutterbridge Cancer Center, which is our local sort of nearby proton therapy center. Uh, this is what it looks like from the front. Um, this is a map of the UK. So Clatterbridge was just across the Mersey River. It's about 30 minutes drive from Liverpool, uh, which is just in this area here. And so Clatterbridge was actually the world's first hospital-based proton therapy facility. Um, it only treats patients with ocular cancers because it has a, a cyclotron which produces a beam of up to 60 MeV protons, which means that it, uh, the proton beam itself only has a penetration depth in water of roughly 31 millimeters, so very shallow. Um, and the facility delivers uh, this beam by passive delivery using a double scattering system, which I'll talk about later. So Clatterbridge was commissioned firstly in 1984, initially for neutron therapy. Um, and so there were several trials that were done and it switched over to a proton service and started treating patients in 1989. This is the schematic of the facility. Uh, so we have the cyclotron and the beam line, and this is the treatment room in here. This is what the cyclotron looks like. Um, and then the beam is generated from here, passes through this big switching magnet in the middle, which used to divert and deflect the beam into another room for um, neutron therapy. And it passes through three of these quadrupole triplet magnets, and then it comes out into the treatment room. So this is the motorized chair um, where the patient is situated as they're treated. Um, so of course it's essential to be able to model and simulate the beam before you put the detector in, so to anticipate what the behavior of the beam will be like um, and to see the impact on the detector uh, before you do any experiments. So um, with the University College London, um, we had this model that was developed in Giant 4 of the Clatterbridge treatment beamline. Um, so it's based on historical beam parameters for the, the particle source or your input beam. Um, and all of the components are based on realistic geometry. So um, they measured everything um, like with a tape measure um, and then rebuilt it in Giant 4. So what this looks like is uh, the accelerator bunker is sort of in this left region and the beam comes out through here. So before it exits into air, it passes through two tungsten scattering foils, which spread the beam laterally. Um, and then we've got a beam stopper here, which actually attenuates some of the beam, so that by the time the beam reaches isocenter, it's got a nice uniform profile. Um, so the beam also passes through uh, two modulation devices, which changes the beam in depth. Uh, we've got this region here, which is an aluminum tube you can remove, and that's where we wanted to integrate our detectors. Uh, the two dose monitors, and then um, this is, these are tungsten wires which basically measure the uniformity of the beam. Uh, the beam exits out the last nozzle. Um, they also build uh, patient-specific collimators in-house at Clatterbridge, and you can put on different ones which collimate uh, the beam specifically to the shape of the tumor for treatment. So essentially with these simulations, we wanted to look at sort of three different things. Firstly, how the beam would propagate in this integration zone here and how the profile would change um, as it traversed down this path. Um, and then to put in a sort of arbitrary silicon disk to see what would happen to the energy spectra and the profile at ISO center, um, so way further downstream. And then another thing was to 
uh, sort of verify how accurate our historical beam parameters were that we were provided by the facility. So the main findings of these studies were basically that our profiles in this region here actually depend pretty heavily on the parameters of the beam that we have at the beginning of the simulation. So as I showed before with PSI, all throughout the facility they have multiple beam diagnostic devices. Um, this provides you an easy check of beam parameters at any point. This is pretty common in any modern facility, but at Clatterbridge, because it's a pioneering facility, they didn't have any beam diagnostics upstream of the dose monitors, uh, which made things quite difficult because uh, if you have our sensors and if we integrate it um, into this integration zone here um, and we compare the measurements with simulations um, and there are discrepancies, these will scale largely as the sensor itself has micron size resolution. Um, so I assume that, well, we assume that basically the measurements that they provided for us had sort of been outdated and it was really difficult to check. Um, there were two approaches though that, um, that we went with to try and circumvent this though, uh, the first being a beam dynamic study. Um, so basically using two different simulation codes, you can simulate the behavior of the beam and how the beam changes as it's transported throughout the beam line and how it's influenced um, by the magnetic fields, uh, by the magnets within the beam line. Um, so basically this allows you to simulate the beam at any point along the beam line, um, which for us the most important point was here, which is our input point of our Giant 4 simulations, and then to generate the beam sigma size and uh, the spread of the beam so that we had a more accurate representation of what the beam looked like in present day conditions. So uh, this was also pretty challenging. Um, again, there were no diagnostics. Basically had to go off documentation um, and an extensive study I did at the facility using everything that was essentially documented over the history of the facility. Um, so there's quite a few unknowns. Um, we couldn't take anything apart or measure anything because it's a treating facility. So this meant that we sort of just had to go with what we had. Um, so converting the legacy and historical numbers as well as information from the accelerator control system, converting these numbers into something useful, um, going off schematics and anything that we could measure to estimate the parameters of the quadrupole magnets. Um, and then optimizing for different facility conditions that were representative of present day, so such as optimizing for transmission and at this point here, we know that the beam should be within this certain range. Um, and then going with a nominal case and from this you can sort of um, figure out where possibly the best location is to design an experiment to actually measure, measure this down the track. Um, so this uh, provides what's known as an optical lattice. Um, which is basically the definition of the beam line itself in terms of the magnetic components. And once you measure the beam, you can sort of adjust your optical lattice to match this later on. Um, so using these codes, um, you can calculate what's known as the twist parameters, um, which looks like this. So it's four different plots. And essentially these tell you how the beam is is moving and how it changes in terms of the magnetic elements along the beam line. So uh, using this information, you can plug it into an equation, which gives you the beam sigma size in the x and y direction in the transverse plane. So basically the size of your beam anywhere throughout the beam line. Um, so as I mentioned, there were quite a few different parameters that we had to optimize for. Um, as you can see, there's quite a huge range of beam sizes that are possible. So we choose a nominal case and the optimized case, which is shown by the solid lines, which gives us some sort of idea where we could potentially integrate some other diagnostics. Um, so we proposed this experiment campaign to measure it, uh, to measure the profiles just before the treatment room. Fortunately, we weren't able to do this, so we had to figure out another approach, um, which is through film measurements. So we wanted to actually physically measure the beam itself. So we had eight bits of film and we put these throughout the treatment line. And of course with film, when it's irradiated, it darkens. And the values of these pixel intensities correspond to an optical density. 
and you can calibrate and convert this so that uh, you know at a certain optical density it should be around this much dose. So plotting the dose against lateral position gives you an idea of the beam profile. So uh, the beginning of the simulation model was about there. Um, it would have been ideal if we could measure at that point. That would make life a lot easier. Uh, but of course, there's different things in the beam line. So we had to sort of reverse engineer this because the closest we could measure upstream was after the scattering foils. And at that point, the beam has already been changed so much um, laterally and longitudinally by the components. So using the beam parameters that we calculated from the, um, the optical lattice and those simulations, uh, using those beam parameters, plugging them into Geon4, and then comparing this to what our film measurements gave us, um, had a little bit of a guess to see how accurate um, then our beam parameters were. And comparing the two, um, it's pretty decent agreement, um, which was good, although this also gave us the room to, if measurements were done in the future, to be able to adjust the optical lattice, which will bring us a bit closer as well. Um, it was also handy because uh, with these measurements, you can also get an idea of the amount of dose um, that reaches sort of this integration zone here. Um, and for us, that's almost up to 10 times the amount of dose um, at ISO center, which was interesting in terms of radiation hardness and when we put other um, components and detectors within the beam line. Um, so we wanted to look at the performance of these Giant 4 simulations um, all throughout the beam line as well. So uh, you can see, I looked at this quantitatively because um, the profiles weren't that great. Um, but there is quite a big difference, and a lot of these sort of come down to different things. Um, one of them being measurements on the day in terms of your beam quality and beam performance, um, errors in film measurements. Um, one thing, though, that we could fix uh, were any differences in terms of the geometry. So further down here, um, a lot of the measurements of these components uh, were also outdated. Um, so, yeah, that was something that we did later on. Um, but another thing that we could do to also double check how our film measurements were uh, was to benchmark these measurements. So um, we had a collaborator come over to, to Clatterbridge and he brought his detector from Amsterdam. Um, so we were able to do some measurements with what's known as the Medipix 3 detector. Uh, so this detector, this is what it looks like here. It's a silicon detector as well, based off technology from CERN. Um, and we wanted to see how the profiles would compare with film and the silicon detector. This was also the first time this detector was used in a clinical proton therapy environment. Um, so it was also interesting to see if this would be applicable for dosimetry um, or quality assurance. Uh, this sort of technology is capable of that. Um, so did some measurements. Um, this here, you can see this flickering. This is actually the beam current in real time. Um, so this was really cool. We could actually, we observed a couple of things that you probably wouldn't be able to see with conventional beam instruments. Um, but otherwise, we got some okay agreement in terms of the film as well. Um, and then, yeah, as I mentioned, so there were a few discrepancies in terms of the geometry. So we went back to Clatterbridge and we remeasured all the different components um, put it into CAD, and then I imported it into another simulation code called Topaz, uh, which is also based off Geon4. Um, so ideally, we wanted to have a simulation platform that future users of the Beamline uh, would be able to have access to and to use and to sort of like upgrade um, and apply for their own experiments. Um, Geon4, though, is, is quite tricky. There is a steep learning curve. So Topaz is a lot more user-friendly um, so we went with this platform and uh, simulating for a Bragg peak, matching this to uh, quality assurance data, we have this curve here. And also simulate lots of different things with Topaz. Um, we simulated the LET across the Bragg curve, which is this here. Um, so as I mentioned, LET is related to the radiobiological effects and outcomes. Um, LET, though, is, is very difficult to measure. Um, 
can't, there's nothing commercial which you can measure LET at the moment. Um, have we did have another collaboration with the Northwest Cancer Research Center who do um, an extensive amount of study into damage and repair of DNA um, with protons versus X-rays um, at two different conditions at high and low LET. Um, so basically we wanted to measure the LET uh, firstly to verify our simulation and to also provide some kind of numerical evidence for their cell studies. Um, so we got a detector from Prague from this company Advocam. Um, so this is called the Mi MiniPix TimePix detector. Uh, the TimePix detector is this small silicon square here. And this detector is also based off technology from CERN. Um, so basically we put the detector in front of the beam and we had a block of PMMA in between um, and we switched uh, different blocks in and out of different thicknesses to shift the position of the Bragg peak um, with reference to the actual detector, so the, the silicon sensitive volume. This is from our data acquisition software. So uh, each one of these red pixels, uh, these like clusters, are actually a track from a single proton. Um, and with their software, they can resolve the individual tracks of protons. So it's really high um, resolution, um, and it's quick enough to be able to detect single tracks, which is what you need for LET measurements. So um, using these detectors, we were able to measure the LET spectra. So taking the energy deposition um, of each track and the length of these tracks, uh, you can determine a range of LETs at each, at each position or water equivalent thickness. Of course, there is a range of LETs because um, there's a huge range of clusters in terms of the amount of energy deposition and the lengths. Um, so sort of optimizing for a single most probable, most probable value, um, you can gain a single LET value and then we simulated the exact same experimental conditions using the Topaz simulation um, and we got some nice agreement as well. Um, and some of this work as well as uh, right now being used in a PhD, in another PhD's work, who's looking at biophysical modeling for treatment planning in proton therapy. Um, so lastly, uh, again, going back to the VELO detectors, we wanted to see if the detectors themselves would work and would function in a proton environment. Um, so over the past years, there's been several upgrades to the detectors, uh, mostly software, some hardware. But you can see the, detector them, the detectors themselves are these, uh, it's what it looks like here, but it's this massive setup. Um, so we went over to the University of Birmingham for three days. They have a 35 MeV cyclotron, which also produces protons. And essentially, we wanted to turn on our detectors and fire beam through it to see if they picked up something and if it, if it worked, basically. So we ran beam with different beam currents and different beam sizes by adjusting the beam size with different collimators in the nozzle. Um, and using all this, we also wanted to look to see if there was a halo dose correlation map that we could establish um, later down the track because, again, we need to correlate this halo region with the total uh, dose distribution. Um, so we got some uh, good results as well. Uh, so this here shows that there's a linear response that even if you increase the current, the response of the detector is still linear. Uh, measurements of the halo region. And we used the same approach. So we simulated the beamline in Gion4 um, and then some fill measurements as well and comparing all three, so film simulations and detector measurements, um, which you can see in this plot here. We also got some decent agreements. So these were the first proof of concept measurements that we had done with the detector after its upgrades. Um, so potentially shows the applicability, maybe later down the track we can develop this technology into something that could actually one day be used for uh, quality assurance in particle therapy. Uh, yeah, and so, yeah, just to summarize, uh, this is pretty much all of the work that I did during my PhD. Um, so lots of different measurements with 
lots of different detectors, especially silicon detectors based from CERN technology. Um, we showed that our VELO detector, uh, it works in a proton environment, um, but in order to correlate the halo with the total beam distribution, you need to have a really good idea of um, the parameters of the beam. For Collaterbridge, this meant that I had to do a, a complete and extensive study uh, to characterize the beam and so to simulate the beam as well as uh, beam transport simulations to look at the beam dynamics. Um, and then now we have this simulation model in Topaz, uh, which we also tried to verify with LET measurements with the time picks detector and there'll hopefully be future applications in terms of the radiobiology as well as uh, the simulation platform for future users. So uh, thank you all for listening. Um, let me know if you have any questions. We have to answer them. So.